The Institute for Faith and Freedom at Grove City College presents Keeping the Faith with your host, Senior Fellow Joe Wolcott. Psalm 16, You Will Not Abandon My Soul, a mictum of David. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, You are my Lord, I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones, in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another god shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out, or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance." I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, and I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Welcome back to Keeping the Faith. I am your host, Joseph Wolcott, and we have a very important topic to discuss today. Um, This is part of our series on exploring theology a little bit. Let Let me set the stage here. We live in a society that operates in very hyper-individualistic ways. And in in many ways, this has bled over into the church. Most churches have vague or simplistic statements of faith, letting the meat of doctrine be driven either by merely the individual discernment or by the theology of the head pastor. This approach is not sustainable, especially in the culture that we live in. Our topic today is one potential great historic remedy to this. Today we are talking about confessionalism. Here to help me with that is our very own Dr. Carl Truman. Dr. Truman was born and raised in England. He's a graduate of the Universities of Cambridge with a master's in classics and Aberdeen with a PhD in church history. He's taught on the faculties of the Universities of Nottingham and Aberdeen before moving to the United States in 2001 to teach at Westminster Theological Seminary in Pennsylvania. From 2017 to two, yeah, sorry, to 2018, he was the William E. Simon Uh, Simon Visiting Fellow in Religion and Public Life in the James Madison Program at Princeton University. Since 2018, he has served as a professor at Grove City College in the Calderwood School of Arts and Humanities. He is widely published in both academic and popular circles, is a contributing editor at First Things and Touchstone Magazine, an opinion columnist at World Magazine, and a fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center in Washington, D.C. His most recent books are The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, Expressive Individualism, Cultural Amnesia, and the Road to Sexual Revolution, and Strange New World, How Thinkers and Activists Redefined Identity and Sparked the Several Revolution, both done with Crossway. And with Bruce Gordon, he helped with the Oxford Handbook to Calvin and Calvinism, published by Oxford University Press. He also has a forthcoming book, To Change All Worlds, Critical Theory from Marx to Marcuse, due later this year from Broadman and Holman. His writing has appeared in uh, Deseret Journal, Wall Street Journal, National Review Online, American Minds, Claremont Review of Books and Public Discourse. He and his wife, Catriona, have two adult sons and a granddaughter. Dr. Truman, welcome to the show. It's great to be here. That was a long introduction. (laughs) Well, you're a man of many accomplishments. Maybe, maybe. So uh, let's just jump right into the topic. Uh, So... We're basing this pretty heavily on your newest book, Crisis of Confidence, which is an update of an older book you have out, The Creedal Imperative. So let's just lay some basic terms here. So what does it mean to be a confessional Christian? Yeah, to be a confessional Christian is to be connected to or a member of a church that holds as its doctrinal standard to one of the great historic confessions of faith. And typically in Protestantism, what we mean by that is something like the Westminster Confession of Faith, Mm -hmm. the 17th century, or uh, the Belgic Confession of Faith of the 16th century, or if you're Lutheran, uh, the Augsburg Confession of Faith of the 16th century. So you are a Mm -hmm. Protestant who belongs to a church that 
is committed to upholding doctrine as taught in one of the great Reformation and immediately post-Reformation mm. confessions. Mm. What would be some of the criteria we would use to look at historic statements of faith to determine if a confession's a good one? So, you know, we speaking as Reformed Presbyterian guys, how would people in our tradition look at the Westminster and say, this is the one that's going to characterize us? Or how would the Lutherans evaluate the Augsburg in that sense, et cetera, yeah, and so forth? That's a very good question. I think the first most basic question one would ask is, how thorough is the confession? Uh, one of the things that uh, the Westminster Confession does is it covers a lot of doctrinal heads, a lot of doctrinal topics. So that would be one question to ask. Second question to ask would be, how does it connect the doctrines? You know, one of the useful things about confessions is it doesn't just set down a series of bullet points uh, doctrinally. It sets forth a vision of the, the whole counsel of God or the major principal heads of the whole counsel of God and indicates by its structure and perhaps by its internal content how those heads connect to each other. Mm. Uh, Christian doctrine is presented as a, a holistic thing. Mm -hmm. uh, thirdly, you know, w whether a confession is good or not depends on whether it, it seems to correlate with what Scripture teaches. And there we would get into certain differences. So a Lutheran, for example, who believes that Scripture teaches that Christ is present according to his humanity in the Lord's Supper would be looking for that doctrine in, in a confession, and there the Westminster Confession would fall down. The Augsburg Confession would be the one. Baptists, let's say, would be looking at what does the confession teach about baptism? Does it teach that infants can be baptized or only adults or only those who've consciously professed faith? Uh, and that would give the Baptist Confession of, of 1689 the edge in Baptist circles. So the question of which particular confession you find good will often track back to what do you actually think Scripture teaches on some of these key heads of doctrine? Yeah, and I'm glad you tied it back to Scripture there because this kind of presents a little bit of a conundrum in the more low church evangelical minds that how can we affirm sola scriptura because all of the groups that you've mentioned there would wholeheartedly affirm sola scriptura, but then how can we do that and then also say the creeds, confessions, and whatnot have some sort of binding authority on us? Yeah. Well, I think the first thing to, to say in response to that is, is, is to acknowledge the importance of that concern. Uh, we certainly don't want to have an attitude to creeds or confessions that means that they somehow supplant scripture or stand alongside scripture as an equal source of authority. So, First thing I'd want to say to an evangelical friend who got that concern is, you are absolutely correct to have that concern. And the burden really falls on me to explain creeds and confessions in a way that, that sets that concern to rest. Question, though, comes back to what do we mean by, by sola scriptura? And, and clearly, in, in, in every church of which I'm aware, we don't mean by sola scriptura that scripture is the only thing we need. Uh, for example, uh, I don't know of any church in the United States of America where the only book you have when you go into the worship service is the Bible, specific, particularly the Bible in Greek and Hebrew. We tend to have translations. We also have hymn books. Uh, we have a minister, typically, who stands up and preaches on a Sunday. He doesn't just read the Bible lesson. He explains it. So we want to avoid uh, a view of sola scriptura where we, we think it to mean that scripture is, is the only thing we need. Clearly, we need something more than scripture for certain things. What sola scriptura means in the, you know, the origin of the principle is that scripture is the ultimate sole authority for determining what the church believes and what the church does. Now, how do creeds and confessions fit into that? Well, I would say the key thing to remember is that the creed or the confession you have is a summary of what Scripture is teaching. The Westminster confession, confession, the Westminster confession thus does not have authority because it is a separate revelation from God. The Westminster Confession has authority because it is understood by those who subscribe to it as accurately summarizing what Scripture teaches. Uh, so I think that that's the, the point to make. And then if I was being, I wouldn't say mischievous, but if I wanted to get my evangelical friend to, to think perhaps more sympathetically about what I'm trying to say, 
I would want to go on and make the point that actually all Christians have creeds of confessions. I, I've never met a Christian, even in uh, the most militantly Bible of Bible churches, who doesn't think the Bible means something. If I ask them what the Bible means, they don't simply start reading at Genesis 1 and finish at the end of Revelation. They explain what they think the Bible means to me. And I would say, what you think the Bible means, that is your confession. The big difference among Christians then is not whether we have a confession or don't have a confession. It's whether we have a confession and write it down so that other people can scrutinize it, or whether we just kind of keep it to ourselves. Yeah, and this... This provides us an opportunity to wonderfully transition to the book. So let's start with the original version. What was your, what was your main argument with the creedal imperative? Yeah. Well, my main – first of all, I'll start with my main concern or my main desire. My main desire in the book was really not to – there are plenty of books out there written for Reformed confessional people telling them how great Reformed confessions are. I didn't want to add to the pile. I, I try when I write to write books that aren't necessarily doing what somebody else has already done. So I didn't want to add to that pile. What I wanted to do was write a book for my evangelical friends to try to persuade them that all of the things that they rightly want to protect about the gospel and about the church could best be protected through adhering to a confession or a creed of some kind. So my target audience was not specifically reformed Presbyterians. My target audience was the people who find John Piper a really good preacher and been very influenced by John Piper. And I wanted to try to persuade the sort of John Piper evangelicals that everything you love and rightly love about the Christian faith can best be preserved and protected through having your church committed to a historic creed or confession. My argument in the book then really wanted to operate along, along lines that I thought my audience would sympathize with. One of the things I do was, of course, say, I've already said, you know, every Christian has a creed or a confession. So that was one of the arguments. Another of my arguments was that the way we understand sola scriptura, and we've come to understand it as meaning we shouldn't have creeds or confessions, that actually connects to certain uh, trends or aspects of, of modern society that say the reformers, who were always writing confessions and catechisms, the reformers would not have sympathized with. So I wanted to be a little bit provocative and get my evangelical friends to, to realize that perhaps we've been a bit more influenced by the modern world than we like to think. Mm -hmm. Third aspect of my argument was actually, while the Bible does not present an argument for creeds and confessions explicitly, Paul, for example, clearly thinks the church is going to have something that plays the role of a creed or confession. Paul tells his, uh, uh, his readers at points to hold fast to a form of sound words. Paul himself will occasionally trot out uh, a formula, uh, for example, Philippians 2, which has the ring of something that Paul has not just come up with himself. This would seem to be perhaps a form of sound words that's circulating in the church. So I tried to make the, I suppose, provocative argument on one level that if you take the Bible seriously, you'll actually have a creed or confession because the Bible pushes us in that direction. So that was the kind of the, the various prongs of my argument, trying to persuade good evangelical people that everything they rightly want to preserve and protect can be best preserved and protected through the use of creeds and confessions. Okay. Yeah. Good stuff. I'm with you on that. Um, to, to the evangelical who's kind of heard your arguments yeah. here and they're like, okay, we're on board. We, yeah. we affirm the truth of all of those arguments you've laid forth. What then should be the role of these creeds and confessions in the life of the church? Yeah. That's a good question, and, and it could vary from church to church and denomination or tradition to tradition. But if I, if I would talk about them relative to my own tradition, the Presbyterian tradition, I think one of the things that creeds and confessions do is it provides a doctrinal standard uh, to which elders and leaders can be held accountable. I think we, we know that elders and leaders should be role models, not only morally, but also doctrinally for the church. So it is important that 
elders and ministers of the church have a more comprehensive grasp of the whole counsel of God than we would require from a humble member. If somebody's converted one week and applies for church membership the next, we don't expect them to have a profound grasp of theology. But if we're going to ordain a man as a minister or an elder, we expect him to have a, a, a competent grasp of theology. So it's, it sets a good standard for deciding that, I would say, the, the theological level of competence for an elder. There's more to being an elder than being a theologian, but it deals with that part. Secondly, I think it uh, ironically uh, enables congregations to hold elders and ministers accountable. If you think about it, if you go to a church where there's no written doctrinal statement of any kind, how do you hold your minister accountable for what he teaches? He can change his mind on who should be baptized from week to week. And if you say, well, you seem to be contradicting the Bible, he might simply turn around and say, no, I'm, I'm, I've just come to a deeper understanding of what the Bible says. Uh, if I stand up in a church as a Presbyterian minister and suddenly declare that the children of believers shouldn't be baptized anymore, the... The congregation have the ability to challenge me on that and say, no, you've taken a vow to teach in a certain way. Uh, we called you to teach in that way. You are not teaching in that way anymore, and so you must resign. So I think creeds and confessions can function a little bit like, you know, if you like the American Constitution. What does the American Constitution do? It, it limits the power of the government. Creeds and confessions both offer a a clear expression of what the church believes and aspires to, but also, you know, interesting enough, limits the power of the minister, holds the minister accountable. So I would say creeds and confessions also function in a, in a good ecclesiological way that way. And thirdly, I think they present a vision of what a rounded Christian faith should be. If you join a Presbyterian church and you say to the pastor, so where would you want to be in terms of my understanding in two years' time? pastor can hand you a copy of the Westminster Confession and say, look, this is all of the stuff we would love you to wrestle with and come to believe and come to love. It's all written out for you here. Go away, read it, come back, let's talk about it. So I think it also provides a really good pedagogical opportunity from that perspective. Yeah. Um, to pivot to a different element yeah. of church life, the recitation of creeds and confessions in the worship service. This this hits on something a little more niche to our corner of the Christian world, but I, I hear a certain certain forms of it echoed in evangelical arguments as well. Certainly not based on the same yeah. principle per se. But how does the congregational recitation of these things fit with? the reformed regulative principle of worship. Uh, for those yeah. for those who are listening and watching, I have not yet gone into great detail on this, but it's the idea that our worship is limited to that which God commands us yeah. rather than what he limits us to. Yeah. Well, I think that's an interesting question. And, and typically when, that, when I'm faced, when I've been faced with that question myself, I'm dealing with people who come from churches that sing hymns. And I make the point to them, hey, you recite non-biblical stuff and I recite non-biblical stuff, every Sunday, hymns. Um, so is it the fact that we don't sing the Apostles' Creed that's the problem? It, 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 so all we need to do is add a tune, call it a hymn, and we can recite it. That's a sort of facetious response, really just to get people thinking. But I would say it doesn't collide with the, the reform principle, uh, the, the regular principle of worship, which is really what the regular principle is doing is it, it fulfills a twofold function, one of which in America, it no longer fulfills. You know, it's really formulated in uh, England uh, and Scotland in the 16th and 17th centuries. And a big part of the regulatory principle is to stop the government interfering in worship. The government can't make you do things in worship that aren't prescribed in Scripture. By and large, that's not a problem in America at the moment. We're not having the government force us to say the Apostles' Creed. Uh, the second aspect of it is it positively lays out what are the elements of worship, uh, uh, prayer, preaching, public re re reading of the word, singing of, harm, uh, of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, uh, the giving of alms. Uh, these are elements of, of worship. And I would say the reciting of the creed does not necessarily contradict or intrude on, on any of those elements of worship, particularly if you sing hymns. If you sing hymns, then you've already conceded that you can, in unison, declare your faith through established forms of words. And you know, push comes to shove, I said, I've got to give 
And the Nicene Creed, formulated by men in the fourth century, many of whom had suffered persecution for their faith, I got to give that, ed that the edge over a hymn by Charles Wesley or you know, by the Gettys. Much as I love the Wesley hymns and I love the Getty hymns, I, I got to give my, my, my confidence probably resides more in the, uh, in the Nicene Creed. So I would say, again, it's an important concern to have. We don't want to do things in worship that are inappropriate. But actually, you know, why single out the creed as the, as the one man-made formula that it's not legitimate to say or to sing in unison in the church? To the exclusive psalmists in the comments who will the exclusive have some psalmists words on this. And, and to be fair to them they they have a much stronger position to push back mm. on where I'm, but I'm not an exclusive psalmist neither and, am and, I and so that would be a different debate but yes certainly if you're an exclusive psalmist I could see you could make a more pungent case mm. against reciting the creed okay um, so I want to move on to just hitting some other concerns that people raise in relation to these just a nice yeah not rapid, rapid fire, but just, you know, quick answers to mm. some common threads I found in doing research for this episode. So I'll throw out the objection, give you the chance to respond. So first one, we've touched on it a little bit already, the idea that creeds and confessions are adding to the yeah. Bible. Yeah. Uh, well, I think they can certainly be treated as sources of authority in themselves, and that's wrong. We need always to remember that the creed or the confession is expressing the truth of Scripture. And if and when a passage or a statement in a creed or confession is found to be at odds with Scripture, then it is appropriate for that to be corrected. I think that should be done by the church and not by individuals. But certainly we want to maintain that the creed or the confession is ultimately subordinate to Scripture. Yeah. Uh, to add to that a little bit, I, I came across one in a, in a more obscure uh, Presbyterian creed, mm -hmm. the the Scots Confession, uh, I was reading not too long ago. And in the preface, it says that, straight, I, I forget the exact wording of it, I wish I put it in my notes, but it says something to the degree of, we implore everyone who reads this creed, if you find us to be out of accord with Scripture, let us know yeah. so that we can examine it and yeah. publicly repent of being out of yeah. line with Scripture. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Um, next one, the use of creeds undermines the perspicuity of Scripture. Which, for those, for those of you who are listening, perspicuity is the I, ironically used word to mean the clarity of Scripture. Yeah. That's a, that would be a whole podcast in and of itself. I would say, first of all, the perspicuity of Scripture clearly doesn't mean that anybody who picks up a volume of Scripture and reads it can come up with the right doctrines. Church history tells us that isn't the case. And if you don't know Hebrew and Greek, the Scriptures ain't perspicuous at all, actually, because they're given in the Hebrew and Greek. You need them to be translated. I would say, no, it does not undermine the perspicuity of Scripture because perspicuity of Scripture is not claiming that you can simply read Scripture and come up with, every individual can come up with a perfect set of doctrines themselves. Okay. Uh, next one here. Creeds and confessions distract from the Bible. They can do. I, I, I'm certainly open to that, that there are people who seem to be more wrapped up in the details of the confession than in their love of Scripture. That's a problem of the human heart. It's not intrinsic to creeds and confessions. That's a problem of the human heart. But certainly, that's one danger to be aware of. Mm -hmm. Creeds and confessions unduly bind the conscience. Um, well, the vows I've taken as a Presbyterian minister to uphold the Westminster Standards are voluntary vows. I have voluntarily bound my conscience to them. And I think the important thing in Presbyterianism is we do not require members of the church to subscribe to the confessions. They simply have to give a credible profession of faith in Jesus Christ. So I think the, the answer to that question is an ecclesiological one in terms of church government. But I would say we need to remember that uh, as a Presbyterian minister, I actually live in a free country. And if I find myself out of accord with the confession and resign as a Presbyterian minister, I'm not going to be sent to prison. I just can't be a Presbyterian minister anymore. Uh, and then this, this last one is one that I hear a lot. Uh, the idea that confessions are divisive. Uh, people, I've heard people formulate it in the sense of, you know, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, whereas it's like, you know, I follow Westminster, I follow yeah. the three forms, I follow yeah. Augsburg. Yeah. 
Well, first of all, that's a misappropriation of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, which is nothing to do with denominationalism and everything to do with cults of personality. So it's a different issue. The question of creeds and confessions being divisive, they can be so. They certainly witness to the fact that uh, people thought that certain doctrines that perhaps a lot of modern Christians neglect, uh, for example, the Lord's Supper, uh, were important. Um, I actually think that creeds and confessions give one a place to stand in order to engage with Christians with whom one disagrees. And I've done this in my own, my own life. I wrote a book with Robert Kolb, the, the leading Lutheran theologian, a few years ago, where we engaged each other on issues we disagree on. And we could do so with clarity and honesty because our commitments were up front in the confessions. We know where we agree. We know where we disagree. And we can enjoy Christian fellowship uh, beyond that. When you think about divisions in this country, the most egregious Christian divisions don't fall along confessional lines. The most egregious Christian divisions are those, you know, why do we have three, four, five Presbyterian denominations? who all agree on the Westminster Confession of Faith, but continue to exist in division. That's more of a problem to me than Presbyterians not being united with the Lutherans. Why is it that those who agree on confessions are divided? So Christian division is much more complicated. And I actually think creeds, confessions give you a place to stand. Yeah, very good. So let's, as we start to enter sort of the second half-ish of this interview here. Let's just go over some of the the big confessions yeah. and then, you know, maybe say a little bit about what makes each of them distinct, yeah. um, you know, what makes them special, yeah. etc. and so forth. So let's let's start with the the good Anglican statement of faith. I know some people don't like to consider it a confession, but I was at um a talk we had on campus with um Lee Gaddis. Lee Gaddis, my old friend, mm-hmm. yes. And he, he argued yes. that the Anglican 39 Articles of Religion are, in fact, a form of confession. Oh, yeah, yeah. So let's talk about that, the 39 Articles. They were certainly subject to subscription. I mean, you had to affirm the 39 Articles to go to Oxford or Cambridge universities uh, in earlier centuries. Yeah, the 39 Articles capture rather nicely the, the Anglican uh, ethos. Um, they are... In some ways, the, there's not a whole lot of difference in substance between the 39 Articles, the Westminster Confession of Faith, and, say, the Belgic Confession of Faith, the Continental one. They're a little earlier than the Westminster Confession, so some of the issues that are in the background of the Westminster Confession are not there in the 16th century, and the Anglican Articles are formulated. They also offer... Uh, a sort of more concessive view than a Presbyterian would on things like ceremonies. Um, But yeah, the 39 Articles are a classic Protestant confession. They contain the scripture principle. They articulate uh, justification by grace through faith. So yeah, the 39 Articles, definitely the the Anglican confession of faith. Mm -hmm. Uh, Moving on then to the Lutherans, you've got, I mean, we talked about the Augsburg a little bit, but then you also have the whole of the Book of Concord. Yeah, the Book of Concord is, if, if any of the listeners get hold of it, it's massive compared to, you know, if you get the Westminster Standards, they're in a book about this thick. Formula, the Book of Concord is, is much thicker. Yeah. The reason for that, there are a couple of reasons for that. One, uh, unlike other, uh, uh, unlike the Westminster Standards, for example, it contains a chunk of writings by one man. You know, Martin Luther's small and large catechisms are both there. Mm-hmm. And the large catechism is like no other catechism you'll ever have looked at. It mm-hmm. isn't a question and answer catechism in the sense that the Westminster Shorter or larger catechisms are. It's more like a set of homilies. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing about the Lutheran confessions is there's a lot there about the Lord's Supper. Because the big thing that distinguishes the Lutherans from the Reformed is the Lord's Supper, and the communication of properties, the Christological background to that. How does the humanity and divinity of Christ connect in the incarnation? And that becomes a very, very elaborate discussion in the late 16th and on into the 17th centuries. That means a lot of the Book of Concord is occupied with pretty elaborate discussion of what to the Reform seems a rather arcane point of doctrine, but is critically important to the Lutherans. So I would recommend anybody listening to this, you know, get hold of the Book of Concord. It's, it's a very important book, contains some beautiful stuff. But it is, 
a compendium of texts that are important, specifically important in the history of the Lutheran Church. Mm -hmm. Uh, Moving on to the two main sets of confessions from the Reformed tradition, our very own Westminster, and then the three forms of unity. So that would be our Belgic Confession, Heidelberg Catechism, and Canons of Dort. Yeah. Well, the the Westminster Standards, three documents put together at the Westminster Assembly, which was convened in the 1640s in England during a time of significant political and civic disruption. Uh, Interestingly enough, the the confession, which is the most elaborate Presbyterian confession that exists and is indeed the textual basis of the Baptist Confession of 1689, uh, the Westminster Confession was the only document that the assembly produced that it expected to function as a confession. It produced the shorter and the larger catechisms as pedagogical tools and as models for pastors to use. So if you're a pastor and you you were not capable of or did not have the time to produce a catechism of your own, you've got a couple of ready-made catechisms for teaching your people. In American Presbyterianism, all three of them have become confessional subscription documents. But if you're looking for uh, the most elaborate statement of Reformed theology, I would say the Westminster Confession of Faith is the one to go for. Mm -hmm. And then the three forms? Three forms written, whereas the Westminster Confession of Faith and the two catechisms were produced by a single institutional body, it, it Membership varied over time, but basically in a short period of time, those three documents were produced in the 1640s. The three forms of unity in, uh, include two works written in the 1560s, um, the Belgic Confession and the Heidelberg Catechism that you've mentioned, and a third set of, uh, of statements, the Canons of Dort, that were produced in the second decade of the 17th century in the Dutch city of Dordrecht dealing with a conflict within church and state there between, uh, we we would now say, the Calvinists and the Arminians within the Dutch Reformed Church. And the Calvinists win. Uh, And the Synod of Dort, it's an international synod. Reformed theologians come from all over Europe and produce these set of of documents that deal with a number of key heads that separate the Calvinists from the Arminians. The Synod of Dort, I think, also uh, adopts the Belgic Confession and the Heidelberg Catechism as the the doctrinal standards of the, we, we now call the continental Reformed churches. So if your listener comes from or is involved in a church that has a Dutch or German origin, in America, chances are your church holds to the three forms of unity in some way and not the Westminster standards. And I would say, you know, of all of the confessional documents we've mentioned, the Heidelberg Catechism, uh, because of its consistent use of the first person, has the most pastoral feel of all of these documents produced in the 16th and 17th century. That's one of the reasons I chose to read from that at the end of That's the show. That's a great decision, great uh, decision. Yeah. Uh, I'll also, I think it's worth mentioning that it's becoming increasingly common to find the Westminster and the three forms bound together in one volume. Uh, I will highly commend to the to the viewers and listeners here the Reformed Standards of Unity put out by Westminster Seminary Press. It brings together Westminster, the three forms, as well as the Second Helvetic Confession, which that's a fun one in its own yeah, right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's that's a really good one. Other... There are other collections I could recommend as well. Ligonier Ministries put yeah. out a pretty hefty tome called We Believe. Um, Chad Van Dixorn has a nice volume from Crossway. Creeds, Confessions, and Catechisms. Has the early church stuff in there as mm-hmm. well. So that's a very nicely produced volume. Yeah. And there's also, I think, a Bible produced by, I think, Crossway. Yes, that the is Creeds and cre- Confessions Bible. Yeah, that, that integrates the Creeds and Confessions mm-hmm. with, with Scripture. It's so. basically Dr. Van Dixorn's book as an appendix yeah. to the Bible. Yeah. Yeah, very good stuff. I've, I've gotten the opportunity to look at one that my friend's one of my friends procured. It's it's very good stuff put up by Crossway. Uh, before we move on from the confessions as well, could you briefly comment on the particular Baptist confession, the 1689? Yeah, the 1689 is, if, if you read it, if you read the Westminster Confession and read the 1689 confession straight afterwards, you'll realize that the, the, the Baptist confession has a lot of textual dependence upon the Westminster confession. Um, 
I recently, in an interview with Dr. Albert Mola, uh, referred to that as plagiarism. Uh, but plagiarism is okay in the you know it's a big sin now. It's okay in the 17th century uh, on a, on a number of fronts, uh, but it's very uh, heavily based on the Westminster Convention. But of course, makes some obvious and necessary changes. Most obviously, it alters the teaching on baptism that the, the the children uh, of believers are not automatically embraced within the covenant and should not therefore automatically be given the covenant sign of baptism. Uh, and it also, I think, uh, I think I'm right in saying it, it, it uses language of ordinance rather than sacrament yeah. for the Lord's Supper and baptism. So it moves things in a little bit more of a, of a non-sacramental direction, which is exactly what you'd expect from, uh, from a, a good Baptist confession. Mm. But I would say, you know, if, if anybody, one of the things it, it, it brings out rather nicely is that many of the Baptists with whom you know, we interact today, their ancestors are not the Anabaptists of the Reformation. Their ancestors are really those who uh, very much appreciated the magisterial reformers, Calvin, Zwingli and company, but just disagreed with them on baptism. So I think the, the Baptist Confession of 1689 is a good reminder that, that you know, Reformed Baptists and Presbyterians, we, we share a lot in common. We do share a lot in common. All right. So moving on to crisis of confidence specifically. Now, that we've kind of laid out some good confessions for yeah. the viewers to keep an eye out for when they're looking at churches and whatnot. How is crisis of confidence different from creedal imperative? Because right. pretty much everything we've been talking about so far has been in the realm of creedal imperative. Yeah. So what's different about this book? Uh, a couple of things. I mean, I mean the, the core of it remains pretty much the same. And there are, there are one or two what I would call superficial sort of changes. I was very struck as I, as I reread the, the book from 10, 12 years ago, how many of the examples I'd used were now out of date. I had sections that, you know, how do you deal with the new perspective on Paul from a confessional perspective? Well, I, I've not heard anybody, you know, tearing their hair out over the new perspective on Paul for some years now. So I, I changed the 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 examples that I would use. I think my primary uh, concern was that the argument of creedal imperative is even more relevant now than it was 10, 12 years ago. Uh, we live in a world that is even more detached from its historical roots than it was. We live in a world which is more awash in subjectivism than it was. And we live in a world where a lot of ethical challenges are being raised to which creeds and confessions can be addressed. One example would be gay marriage, for example. Um, you know, one of the things I heard mentioned around about 2014, 2015, in the kind of circles that I operate in was, you know, do we not need to add a section to our confessional documents on, on gay marriage? And my argument for that was always, well, maybe, but I don't think so. And I don't think so for the following reason. The confession, the Westminster Confession, actually has a really good positive exposition of marriage which excludes any other definition of marriage you might care to come up with. So we don't need to be constantly looking at the latest contemporary definition of marriage and adding sections to the confession. We just need something that tells us what marriage is, and that allows us to recognize all of the imposters or false alternatives. So one of the things I wanted to draw out in Crisis of Confidence was how you know, we talked earlier on about sola scriptura and scriptural sufficiency. I think there's also a certain confessional sufficiency as well. It's just a question of knowing how to use the confession. And that goes back to, I think, the first or second answer I gave today. And I said one of the things that creeds and confessions do is they show you how the whole thing fits together. We might say they show you the ecology of Christian theology. So when we get very challenging uh, contemporary questions raised in the realm of ethics. Creeds and confessions, by giving us a clear, comprehensive theological structure, allow us to see the significance of the challenge and to, to address it. So I think, you know, to borrow the, uh, from the title of another of my books that you mentioned, you know, the modern self, I think, can be greatly helped by thinking about how creeds and confessions, what they say, and how they function in the church. Hmm. Would it be fair to say that this book is something of a marriage between 
um, between Creedal Imperative and Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. Yeah, it's a it's a sort of it's it's a rejigging of the Creedal Imperative argument in mm. light of stuff that I uncovered and became concerned about mm. in in the Rise and Triumph. Which, if if those of you who are listening haven't checked out that, do read that. I, I read Rise and Triumph over not last summer but the summer before, and it was. Really good stuff. And of course, those of you who are listening who are Grove students will probably hear a lot of that as well in our Christianity and Civilization course. Um, yeah, uh, uh, just to get some closing thoughts here, what would you say to the Christian watching or listening to this who's still unsure and uncomfortable with the idea of creeds and confessions? Yeah, well, first of all, I want to say, you know, it isn't sinful if your church doesn't have a creed or confession. You're not, you're not sinning mm. in that. But I would ask the question, is your church uh, as healthy as it could be? What, where are the mm. vulnerabilities? If you don't have a creed or confession, where is your church vulnerable? And how are you going to address those vulnerabilities? You know, you raised, uh, Joseph, a number of good vulnerabilities for creeds and confession people. They become formalist. Uh, they replace scripture. Those are things that confessional churches could be vulnerable to. But I think it's, it, it behooves those in non-confessional churches to think about, well, where are we vulnerable? And okay, if we don't want to go down the creeds or confessions route as the answer, that's okay, but you've got to come up mm-hmm. with something better. Mm-hmm. You've got to come up with something better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's that's good. That's, that's a wrap. Um, I will just conclude our episode with this episode selection from the Heidelberg Catechism. Wonderful. Lord's Day 16. Question 40. Why was it necessary for Christ to humble himself even unto death? Answer. Because of the justice and truth of God, satisfaction for our sins could be made in no other way than by the death of the Son of God. Question 41. Why was he buried? Answer. His burial testified that he had really died. Question 42. Since Christ has died for us, why do we still have to die? Answer. Our death is not a payment for our sins, but it puts an end to sin and is an entrance into eternal life. Question 43. What further benefit do we receive from Christ's sacrifice and death on the cross? Answer. Through Christ's death, our old nature is crucified, put to death, and buried with him, so that the evil desires of the flesh may no longer reign in us, but that we may offer ourselves to him as a sacrifice of thankfulness. Question 44. Why is there added, he descended into hell? Answer. In my greatest sorrows and temptations, I may be assured and comforted that my Lord Jesus Christ, by his unspeakable anguish, pain, terror, and agony, which he endured throughout all his sufferings, but especially on the cross, has delivered me from the anguish and torment of hell. Dr. Truman, thank you for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. This is Keeping the Faith. I am your host, Joseph Wolcott. The book is Crisis of Confidence, and I will see you in the next episode.